Good afternoon from beautiful Brisbane, Australia, and welcome to Complex PTSD TV Live. I'm Linda, I'm your Certified Trauma Recovery Coach, and welcome to our platform where we get to share lots of information about complex PTSD that is professional, it is effective, it is very easy to follow along and it makes a whole lot of sense. It's practical. If you're here for the first time, welcome. And if you're here, if you're one of my followers who, you know, jump on in and say good day on YouTube and Facebook, it's great to have you following along and I really appreciate all your feedback. Hi, Ali. Uh, for now, if you'd like to hit the like button, share, comment, subscribe so you know when I go live, that would be fantastic. And mainly because there are so many people suffering from complex PTSD in the world globally. So I work with clients globally and it's happening everywhere. And people want real life answers that are effective, not some marketing <laughs> Rah, rah, that's just not helping them get along at all. So today I wanted to share with you some pretty vital information about spiritual bypassing. Now, a spiritual bypass or spiritual bypassing is a tendency to use spiritual ideas and practices to sidestep or avoid facing unresolved emotional issues, a psychological wound, or unfinished development, like, or unfinished developmental tasks. And it was first coined in the 1980s. And I really like how it mentioned the psychological wound because with complex trauma, it's something that we are dealing with daily to in our recovery journey to overcome is this psychological wound. And the other side of it is the developmental trauma we have to be willing to do the work to overcome that as well. Now, there's so we need to stop using our spirituality to avoid susp suppress or escape from uncomfortable issues in life. So I want you to think about complex trauma and the habits that we develop in childhood. Now, they can be unconscious habits as well. That's the challenge. And until we do our internal journey, we don't know that we've got these unconscious habits, okay? So until we really take time and take stock to see and notice what's happening with us inside, then we don't know that we have unconscious habits that are actually sabotaging our life, the fullness and health of our life, okay? So we can't continue to push down, suppress, ignore, deny, that these things, that the uncomfortable issues in life, in our current day life as an adult, are causing us to have mental health challenges, all right? What we can do is begin to recognise them so that we can learn how to work through, work with them, identify them, and put in place very practical steps so that it comes into our day-to-day -day life and we begin re not remapping our brain, we actually begin creating new maps for our brain to go down, okay? So I was explaining, so excuse me, I was explaining to a client the other day that well, how does it look like to make a new map? And I said, so you imagine that you're one of the frontier people who went out and discovered new lands. You know, they faced a whole lot of, well, it could be oceans, but for the part of this analogy, they faced whole lots of woods and mountains and forests, trees, you know, the whole bunch and dots just happening in front of them. And they could see no way through. And we can get to places like that with our complex PTSD. We can see no way through. But the way through is actually to continue to take one next step and carving a new pathway. And as we carve these new pathways in our life, it means that we don't go back down old roads. It means that our brain can stop being triggered over day-to-day -day life stuff. So we are creating this whole new life for ourselves, for our brain to stop responding in old ways, okay? And if we don't do this, then our brain will continue to respond in the same way it has for years, all right, from the deep pressure responses, from the anxiety-driven responses, and so on. 
Now, spiritual bypassing, we can these are all around the spiritual side of life, okay? So when it comes to spiritual bypassing, we want to look at different types in order that we can identify either what's happening for us, what we need to do, or so that we can understand what's happening for someone else and have some grace and compassion, all right? Now, I'm going to talk about a higher power, but how you integrate that into your life is that you're an adult, I'm an adult, and you need to integrate that into your life, how it suits you for the stage of your recovery where you're at, okay? This is not about religion, this is about relationship, and it's about having a higher power that is greater than you, something that's greater than you, and that you can have that relationship with. And I'll talk more about that at the end, but let's go through seven types of spiritual bypassing. So there's the optimistic bypass. So I want you to think of somebody whose glass is always half full and if you're down or depressed, they're like, well, you're the one with the problem. You know, life is wonderful. And they have that attitude irrespective of what's going on behind closed doors. All right, so they have this whole uh, persona built around, you know, what's your problem? Be happy. Go, you know, and we don't, that's not a really authentic way to live life. And for all the gurus out there who teach you, only associate with people who are happy and positive and vibrant and full of life, well, you're going to come undone because those people are human and they aren't that way 24-7 and they are ignoring deep stuff that's happening within them, right? Because no matter what happens, life happens, changes happen, and we have to develop a skill set around managing that. And we can be positive, but we don't inflict it on everyone all the time. But in our positivity, we also acknowledge that we have our struggles as well. So both things can exist at the same time, okay? Now... If we've had trauma in our life, this can be a trauma response because if we're afraid of anger, all right, or we have an inability to deal with negative emotions, all right, and I want you to understand that we can come out of our families of origin and we can be afraid of anger if there was a lot of anger in the house. We can be afraid of expressing anger. We can be afraid of other people being angry at us because we don't know, we haven't learnt the skill set of how to manage that. Now, I know I went through a lot of years of being afraid of anger. I'm married to angry men, so being afraid of that anger shut me down. It wasn't until I learnt that I didn't have to be afraid of anger and that I could speak up and say, look, I just want to have a conversation about this. You know, I don't want all the angry responses. I want to be an adult and communicate through this, that I became aware that not everybody was going to want to have that conversation. And we need people who are willing to own that they're angry, own that, you know, if they're not. But either way, be willing to have that conversation around what's happening for you. And we want to look at people who always point the finger as well, okay? Uh, but we'll get to that. So think for yourself now. Are you afraid when people get angry? Are you afraid to express your anger? Where do you sit with your skill set around anger for yourself? And when somebody else is angry, what's your first internal response? And whatever you do, don't live in the land of denial, okay? If we've got an optimistic bypass, then we need to be willing to own that too. And I have had it in the past simply just to get by, all right? Uh, this is, you know, many years ago when the kids were young. I had to have it just to get by because... I was being stopped at every point trying to find a solution that fitted both of us and it wasn't going to happen. Well, it didn't happen. Okay, number two, the victim bypass. 
People who identify as spiritual seekers can use the victim bypass by believing their happiness and good health is dependent on the behaviour of other people or dependent on other people not behaving in self-destructive and volatile ways. So people who identify as empaths can use this victim bypass. Now, I didn't say if you're an empath, you're using it, okay? I said if you identify as an empath, you might be using this as a bypass to stand up and face what you need to face. We, with childhood developmental trauma, we actually develop this incredible ability to be empathic because we sit and observe all the behaviour that's going on in front of us, okay? We watch, we learn, we preempt what, what the abusers are going to do to the best of our ability as children. But as life goes by, it's like we begin to see patterns in people and we have a deeper understanding, well, some of us do end up having a deeper understanding of what's happening for people internally than they do themselves because we've learnt to observe. So being an empath can be part of a trauma response but we don't want to use it as a bypass and say, well, if somebody else is being self-destructive, uh, it's my responsibility to step in and hold the fort or, you know, I can't be who I am because of who they are. We can't do that, all right? Otherwise, we will continue with mental health challenges and we won't grow. It's like growing out of everything that we had to be in order to survive that period of time. I thought this one was quite funny. It's called the horoscope bypass. So this spiritual bypass happens when people look outside of themselves for answers that are found from the wellspring of life inside of, the, of us. It comes from the trauma response of fear and mistrust of ourselves, our inability and fear of making decisions, and our inability fear of dealing with anything tough that comes our way. Now, I want you to be really honest with yourself. Do you trust yourself to make decisions? Now, if you've come out of a broken relationship, you will know exactly what I'm talking about because you go, that's never going to happen again to me. I'm not going down that road. And in that statement alone, it says, I really am having trouble trusting myself, making a decision about who can be in my life, all right? And there's a whole skill set around that as well, about how we go about developing relationships in a healthy manner. So we want to be able to go, okay, I don't need to go outside of myself. I don't need to look in the local paper what's happening in my life today. I need to sit and be in the presence of my higher power. I need to sit and feel that inside of me. And I need to be able to discern my one next step. Now, it takes practice, but it's doable. The saint bypass. When we've been conditioned as children to believe that spiritual people are kind, caring, loving, generous, uh, endless patience, and so on, this comes out as a trauma response in adulthood, whereby we avoid the hard work of developing courage and resilience and facing our own dark side, we find ourselves self-sacrificing and believing no one ever notices that I have needs, okay? So we have to be willing to say, okay, I am running around, you know, um, I've got a thorn in my side and I'm saying that people don't notice my needs. But then I have to ask, am I telling anyone what my needs are? in a kind, gentle way and working through how we can make that happen. Because if you're living in a household with other people, then you have to be willing to communicate as well. You also have to be willing to see and own what's happening inside of you and stop ignoring it, all right? I had to do that. It's hard. And I still do that to this day as I walk the recovery journey successfully. I'm still addressing what's happening for me internally what are the old habits that are still there and how can I learn to better that and make it a healthier process during relationships and especially with abandonment, 
am I stopping myself from connecting? Or if I have a new connection in my life, what am I doing to make sure that I'm identifying the fear? Am I identifying if I'm feeling that I'm not going to be able to trust my decision? Now, the way we go through that as well is being willing to learn how to trust our decisions. And there's a whole structure and strategy around that, especially when we're adults who've had childhood developmental trauma, then in adulthood have relationship breakdowns. We need to be willing to do this work, okay? The prayer bypass. The prayer by bypass takes away our personal responsibility to step and solve our problems. As we believe that our higher power will step in and sort out our life. A prayer life is healthy provided we do our internal awareness work and don't rely on our higher power to do those things that we need to do. Now, one of the things that I notice throughout life and throughout having a journey of faith that people tend to say, oh, you know, my creator, God, Lord, is going to step in and solve this. Well, no, our creator isn't somebody that steps in and is a magical genie and waves a wand and all of a sudden this is going to disappear. No, it won't happen. We have to adult and step up and take personal responsibility, not just for our part in it, but for the decisions we have to learn how to make, for the conversations we need to learn how to have, and the good news is it's all doable. So we need to be aware when we're using God as our um, leaning post and waiting for him to move when it's actually us that have got to move into develop, being willing to develop the courage to have healthier relationships, okay? The guru bypass, um, having a spiritual teacher, someone you look up to can be a healthy thing, but if we you know, start looking up to them consciously, unconsciously and expecting that they will provide answers for our life instead of us taking personal responsibility and integrating new information into our life in a way that is healthy and helps our life become dynamic and progressive and we, you know, want to live out the plan and purpose for our lives, then it's not a healthy thing. We're giving over the responsibility for our life, our individual life, to somebody else. And that is not a healthy thing to do. We will continue, on top of the trauma, we continue to put the responsibility onto other people when we're the adults. And we've got to be willing to do this and say, that's great. I love how that person teaches. This is what I've learned. And this is how I want to integrate it into my life. And it's about thinking for ourselves and, you know, not everyone's sitting there nodding their head and going, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. We want to take that thought process further and go, okay, what does that mean for me? How do I want to put that information to work in my life so that it's productive, right? And how is that helping me heal the wound that's in my heart from all the things that have happened in my day-to-day -day life. If you don't get an answer, then keep asking questions. And if you run out of questions, give yourself breathing space to sit back and think about what's another question I could ask, all right? And I found over the years as I was prepared to do that, that it made it a lot easier for me to begin asking even more productive questions. All right, and then I realized that once I found the right question, the answer appeared very easily. Okay, the procrastination bypass. Now, we have to be careful because with complex PTSD, we do have a trauma response that's procrastination. And I've done a video and it's on YouTube, easy to find on my channel, and about procrastination and how it's impacted by a trauma response or how the trauma response drives the procrastination. But with procrastination being a spiritual bypass, we have to be willing to look at where we're blaming everyone else, all right? 
saying that they're the ones with the problem, it's not me. And one of the most up-to-date references in this is if you ever watch a reality show, which I rarely do, I watched one earlier this year, uh, it was about houses, actually, and I just love looking at those these most beautiful, magnificent mansions. I uh, think they're beautiful, but we never want one. <laughs> House cleaning, no thanks. But the real estate agents doing the selling, their conversation says, well, she triggered me. She triggered me. She triggered me. And I'm sitting there going, but you're responsible for your emotional re reactions, okay? You're responsible for what happens for you internally. You are the one that needs to dig in and work out what's happening or go and have a conversation with that person and work out if that's what they meant, what's happening with you. See your psychologist, see your trauma coach and begin to understand that internal pathway for you, what it means, so that you don't get triggered anymore, okay? Uh, so we need to be willing to be aware of when procrastination is happening so that we don't put off working out what triggered us, understanding it at a deeper level and then putting structure and strategies in place so that we can remap, not remap, so that we can map new neural pathways into our brain as well. Um, you're welcome, Carol. Uh, Carol says that Linda as a child I was raised by a very loving family unit. I've always felt love from my parents, brother and sisters. I'm assuming that means why do I have a mental health challenge now? Unfortunately, when we, even if we've been raised with the most loving experiences, emotional neglect can cause stress and it can cause the abandonment wound to flare up. Uh, it's about connection at a deeper level. And unfortunately, the generations that have gone before us, sorry about that, the generations that have gone before us, they haven't had emotional language. So what we need to do is sit down and say, do I know the different layers of my emotions? So I, instead of just saying, oh, I'm sad, okay, can you look back and as you reflect through that, work out what the different layers are that built into that particular point in time of feeling sad. And this is where this emotional connection, the bonding we have with people, the ability as adults to talk through the challenges that invariably come, because no family is perfect, okay, the challenges come. And we need to be willing to do this with each other and for each other with the families that we're in. So even if Nick and I have different ideas about how we're going to manage a situation, both of us will sit and both of us will talk through what we thought. And we often find that our thoughts about what was going to happen are totally different. And <laughs> so we've learned to laugh more. <laughs> And this is why it's so, so vital to have these conversations because we can be thinking two different things. And then if we're thinking two different things, you can guarantee that we're feeling two different things. And on and on it goes. So then our behaviour, it becomes a totally different thing to what each other expected. But we work it out together in order that there's harmony and... We're not afraid of anger. We will always work it through. And these are the dynamics that we're needing to have in our family situations. When And I'm not saying it's easy. Believe me, the hardest thing I ever did one time was I was so angry at Nick and we, got, we had to go shopping. We had to go food shopping. So we went shopping and he said, you know, you're obviously upset. Like I, I virtually had tears start rolling down my eyes at the shops and we, I said, not now, we'll do the shopping first. So we do the shopping, got in the car and he said, I really want you to tell me what's wrong. And the hardest thing I ever did was actually tell him, like find the courage to tell him what was wrong because it's a risk vulnerability at that level is a risk because you don't necessarily know how the other person's going to respond. 
Now, that's okay because we're learning to know each other at a different level as he's become an adult. And as our, all of my children have become adults, we've learnt to know, they've learnt to know me not just as mum but as Linda who actually has a life and works and so on, who has mental health challenges and so on. So it becomes a different relationship altogether. But when I was in a marriage, the re it was very hard. I couldn't be that vulnerable because it didn't matter what I said, the other person always exploded in anger. There was no ability to have that conversation. And when there's no willingness on the other person's part to have that conversation, then the conversation is not going to happen ever and never did. But, Carol, with your family, you're probably looking at that your family wouldn't know how to have those deep conversations or generations before that didn't because we're living in a world where these kinds of conversations aren't the norm behind closed doors. So what's happening for me is we've had to be willing to develop this process through the different ages and stages with the kids and now they're adults, now they do their own internal work, etc., etc. So I guess that's the greatest gift is that they have this ability to do their internal work and take responsibility for what's happening for them as well. Okay, I've run out of time, I'm sorry. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about a couple of clients that have had different spiritual experiences as well, but I don't want to keep you too long. I want to value your time, so I will talk about them another time. And I will also talk to you about different ways of coming through spiritual bypassing as well in the next video. Thanks for joining in. Remember to like and subscribe and share for all of those around the world who are our silent majority, all right? They are our silent majority who are still suffering with mental health challenges and still haven't even got to point A, knowing that there are people who love and genuinely care about their health and their recovery, okay? And I will see you next week. Bye for now.